بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده أما بعد uh, It's been quite a while since I have done a library chat <coughs> and uh, inshallah I thought it's time to update uh, my library chat list and I was going to continue uh, from where I left off which is the uh, the uh, incident of the Karamiya and then what happened after that. But then I realized that, you know, I had actually forgotten or not forgotten, overlooked a very important precursor, uh, which does situate what we're going to be talking about. And so what I'm going to be doing now is then taking a step back and talking about uh, setting up the rise of uh, Sunni Kalam and then uh, situating the uh, inter-Sunni polemics that we're going to be talking about in the next lecture, uh, inshallah ta'ala, if Allah gives me life and we continue down this uh, this trajectory so that you understand it better. So the usual disclaimers, uh, this is a library chat, and so this one in particular uh, is going to be one of the uh, for advanced uh, theological discussions. And so if you haven't studied advanced theology, if you don't know what is Kalam and what is Sunni Kalam and what is Ash'arism and Maturidism and Atharism and Mu'tazilism, if you haven't heard of the names of Al-Muhasibi and Al-Ash'ari and, and whatnot, then uh, this is really not a very beneficial topic. And I always make this disclaimer, so go listen to something that is a benefit so that inshallah ta'ala, you know, you will uh, fill your uh, time with something that will actually bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These types of discussions are meant for those that are interested in the development of Islamic theology and uh, have a passion and interest in a more academic field. Also, another very important uh, disclaimer, um, given my background and given the fact that at one time in my life I was uh, polemical against the Ash'ari school. Uh, uh, for those who know me, obviously now that is no longer the case, but I must make this disclaimer that everything that I'm saying today, uh, it is not being said uh, in the spirit of refutation or in the spirit of finding faults or deviancy. At this stage of my life, I do not view uh, the Ash'ari school or the Athari school or the Maturidi school or any of the mainstream Sunni schools as being deviant or incorrect. And uh, frankly, I have made my disagreements with all of the strands at a theological level, disagreements at a personal level. And I think they're all good fi kullin um, khair. And I have my own views and uh, perhaps one day I'll give a library chat about uh, those views and uh, we'll see what happens after that. But uh, I want to be very clear from the get-go that please do not misinterpret or misunderstand uh, the anything that is said today as somehow trying to to demean uh, the credit of the Ash'ari school or to somehow you know uh, 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 criticize them in a subtle manner. Anything that I say that um, uh, comes across that way, I could say the same about the Athari school or any other school. And so please understand this. I am I am not doing this in the spirit of of refutation per se. Uh, I firmly believe that all of these uh, schools. Uh, have developed over time. They are not divinely revealed. Uh, that that includes Atharism as well. And one day I do plan to give a very detailed chat about the development of the Athari theology, this, this simplistic notion that Ibn Taymiyyah is somehow representative of Atharism with my utmost love to Ibn Taymiyyah that is simply factually false. There were many competing strands even of Atharism and uh, Ibn Taymiyyah represents one strand which then became the dominant uh, strand. The same applies to the Ash'ari school as well that the Ash'ari school is not just one uh, position. Actually you have a, a multitude of, of, of opinions under the umbrella of Ash'arism and uh, there's a development taking place the same of Maturidism, the same of Mu'tazidism. This is the reality when you study and you are open-minded and you're not Coming with the agenda to prove that, for example, you know, a Razi is the defining Ash'ari. Well, then, if you have that preconceived notion, then you're going to view history in a different manner. So, anyway, all of this is a disclaimer. Uh, and uh, one day, inshallah, I will give a talk about uh, uh, the Athari school, which is something that is uh, very, very clear to document the developments of the Athari school and the intra athari debates that took place uh, until finally one of them became the dominant. But today, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the beginnings of Ash'arism, proto-Ash'arism, or to be more precise, Sunni Kalam. Sunni Kalam. 
Now, if you've uh, uh, listened to not just my library chats, and in particular, the origins of the Sifat controversy, listen to that one, and other talks that I've given, and if you're aware of, you know, general Islamic theology, you are very familiar with the term Kalam. By the way, if you don't know the term Kalam by now, you should not be watching this video, please. I'm trying my best to preach and teach at the appropriate level. So if you don't know what Kalam means, Stop this video, go watch something else. Anyway, let's forget with the disclaimers from now on. Um, so uh, the, 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 the phenomenon of Kalam, as is very clear, undeniable, the phenomenon of Kalam uh, was a phenomenon that did not have anything to do with the groups of scholars who cared about the hadith of the Prophet wasallam and compiled it and narrated it, i.e. the muhaddithun, uh, the traditionalist uh, ulama. They did not like kalam and they were opposed to kalam. The people who embraced kalam were those that were eventually called the Mu'tazilites. Right? These are the ones who embraced kalam. And also there were strands of Mu'tazilism and so the term jahmi, the term Mu'tazili, these are all coming later on, of course, that uh, you back project them onto these figures. And these figures are clearly propagating uh, what we call Neoplatonic concepts. I explained this in my uh, Sifat lecture. And they were not the people interested in compiling hadith and in narrating hadith, i.e. they're not Sunni Muslims, right? That's the whole point. That's what uh, a Sunni Muslim in the beginning of Islam, the first two, three centuries, Sunni Islam is about uh, paying attention to the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ with the chains, narrating them. And generally speaking, Sunni scholars did not get involved in uh, these sophisticated debates about the reality of the attributes of Allah and they shunned that type of discourse and they considered it to be heretical and a deviation. Uh, now, the, the, first, uh, the first theologians who claimed to be Sunni and also embraced Kalam, right? So this is now a new phenomenon coming. The first person to do so is generally credited to be Abdullah ibn Sa'id ibn Kullab. Ibn Kullab is how he is known, and he died 241 Hijra, i.e. 855 CE. And a contemporary of his, Al Harith ibn Asad al Muhasibi, who died 243 857. So Ibn Kullab and al Muhasibi are the two main figures who are claiming to be Sunni. Now, neither of them. Uh, were famous for hadith narration, but overall they are studying in the circles of hadith and their theology is affirming qadr. So here's a key difference. Early kalam rejected qadr. The Mu'tazila rejected Qadr. Uh, Ibn Kulab and Al-Muhasibi are affirming Qadr. This is a defining characteristic of Sunni Islam at the time. And so they affirm Qadr. They're studying amongst the scholars of you know, uh, uh, Sunni learning. And now they are flirting with, they're embracing aspects of uh, Kalam. Now Ibn Kulab, we have nothing left of his writings. He did leave some writings, but uh, unfortunately nothing remains of his writings. So we can glean some opinions of his uh, as recorded by uh, Al-Ash'ari, his student in his kitab, meaning indirect student, not directly, uh, studied uh, from a student of his. So uh, Al-Ash'ari in his kitab al-Maqalat, uh, he records many opinions of Ibn Kulab. As for Al-Muhasibi, Al-Muhasibi has left us a number of treatises. Unfortunately, his main treatise of theology is not present, but we do have a number of treatises from which we can glean uh, certain ideas of his. And the t these two theologians, their main contribution to uh, theology was their claim that Allah does have attributes unlike the Mu'tazila, who said that uh, in reality, these are not actual, you know, attributes. I'm, I'm being very simplistic even for this talk, by the way, because that's not exactly what the Mu'tazila said. But essentially, uh, you know, their, their, their uh, conundrum was, as, as I said in my other talk about uh, uh, the uh, Safad controversy, how does one describe Allah with these attributes? And generally speaking, you know, they were deemed by their opponents to deny the attributes even though that's not technically correct they are it's simply a matter of language of how one expresses it uh, the uh, al-muhasibi and ibn kulab come along and they posit that allah indeed is a samir and al-basir and al-alim however they posited that these attributes are eternal and unchanging. لا تحدث به الحوادث لا تحل به الحوادث And this is a key uh, John of Damascus or, or Neoplatonic term as if you go back to that lecture that uh, change 
does not exist within the uh, nature of God. No change could be posited within the that, within the essence of uh, God. And so they affirmed the attributes, but they said these attributes are static. These attributes cannot change. And the classic difference, therefore, is over the attribute of speech. Uh, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal uh, and Al-Bukhari and others, they would say that Allah speaks when he wants to speak. And uh, he is silent when he wants to be silent. This is uh, Ahmad ibn Hanbal explicit, affirmed him from his students. We don't have his writings, but his students say this. And generally, that is what we would expect from Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Al-Bukhari also has statements uh, in Khalq al bayd and others in, in which we can glean this. Also, his, Sahih, his Kitab al-Sahih al-Bukhari also, you can glean these types of, of uh, uh, theological positions that Allah speaks when he wants to. However, of course, when you say that uh, the, the attributes are eternal, then uh, the notion therefore would be from Al-Muhasibi and from Ibn Kullab, and this later is adopted by the Ash'ari school, that Allah Azza wa Jal is speaking eternally uh, in a manner that his creation cannot comprehend through the senses. So Allah's speech is an internal speech, that it is an eternal speech, internal and eternal. Internal meaning that it is not expressed in a voice and a sound. Uh, it is, an, a, a, as Al-Ghazali famously remarks, it is a speech internally, a dhati, or a speech of the mind. It's not an actual uh, speech. So Al-Muhasib and Ibn Kullab, they bring forth what is now called Sunni Kalam. They are the founders of Sunni Kalam. And uh, Al-Muhasibi seems to have had a larger impact than Ibn Kullab. And uh, the next generation uh, scholar, Al-Baghdadi, who died 429 Hijrah, Al-Baghdadi, Abdul Qahir Al-Baghdadi, remarks uh, that most of the people of Kalam who affirmed the attributes, so this is really interesting, most of the people of Kalam who affirmed the attributes because there was a group of people of Kalam who didn't affirm the attributes, that's, that's the Mu'tazila. Most of the people of Kalam who affirm the attributes, this is Sunni Kalam, this is going to become Ash'arism. And Al-Baghdadi is an Ash'ari as we're going to discover or we're going to come to. So most of the people of Kalam who affirmed the attributes ascribe themselves to Al-Muhasibi. This is what Al-Baghdadi is writing in 429, that they ascribe themselves to Al-Muhasibi. Al-Muhasibi becomes the main primogenitor. And actually, if you read his writings, uh, you actually see Ghazali and Islam, that combination of Tasawwuf, that combination of Ash'ari uh, uh, Kalam and, and actually Shafi'i Fiqh, uh, that Muhasibi really becomes the, what we now call, I would say, proto-traditionalist. In our term, in our time, there's this traditionalist movement. Al-Muhasibi really becomes like the father figure and Ghazali becomes the codifier and the reviver. And so Ghazalian understanding of Islam, it actually goes back to Muhasibi and this has remained for many, many centuries until our times. Uh, one of the most analytical early accounts of Al-Muhasibi's theology is uh, given by none other than Al-Shahrastani, died 548 Hijra, 1154 CE. Al-Shahrastani is a very interesting figure who deserves an entire lecture. Al-Shahrastani is neither Ash'ari nor uh, philosopher. He is an independent thinker. However, if anything, he is more inclined towards philosophy than towards kalam. And there is a distinction between philosophy and kalam as maybe another talk we'll talk about. But uh, some people claim that kalam and philosophy is the same thing. No, not at all. Kalam is very different, even though it shares certain uh, characteristics with falsafa. Nonetheless, a shahrastani is an independent thinker. And it is useful for someone like Shahrastani to comment because when he says something, then both Salafis and Ash'ari should pay attention because he's a third party. He is neutral. Shahrastani says in his famous book, Al-Milali wa Nihal, and I quote, or I'm summarizing for, directly from the book, that the Ahl al-Hadith scholars, such as Malik ibn Anas and Ahmed ibn Hanbal, notice he's categorizing them together, right? Shahrastani views early Ahl al-Hadith as one movement, which really it is would not categorize or differentiate between the attributes of Allah mentioned in the text and would affirm all of them in a kafiyyah known to Allah. Notice here, Shahrastani is saying the early Sunnis affirmed the attributes with a kafiyyah known to Allah. Uh, and this uh, very much shows that this notion of tafwil as some modern um, Ash'aris and modern pseudo Hanbalis are trying to revive, uh, my contention or my claim is would be that that notion did not exist uh, the way that they claim it, that a different type of tafwid existed. Shah Rastani is saying they affirmed the attributes, all of them, in a kafiyah, with a kafiyah that is known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he says, listen to this, 
since the Mu'tazila would negate the attributes and basically Sunnis would affirm them, these Sunnis were called Sifatiyya, affirming the attributes. And the Mu'tazila were called Mu'attila, negating the attributes. This remained the case until the time of Ibn Kullab and Al-Muhasibi for these two ascribed themselves to Sunni Islam but embraced the knowledge of Kalam and supported the doctrines of Sunnism through Kalam and through logical reasoning, end quote. So Al-Shahrastani is the one who points out that Ibn Kullab and Al-Muhasibi really were the first people to start something new and to start categorizing the Sifat. This is a key point here. The early scholars did not categorize the Sifat. All of them are uh, affirmed in, in a manner that is known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these uh, two giants come along, Ibn Kullab and Al-Muhasibi, and they're the ones who began to uh, differentiate between the uh, Sifat. Now, it's really interesting here that Al-Muhasibi and Ahmad ibn Hanbal, they met multiple times. Al-Muhasibi and Ahmed ibn Hanbal uh, were contemporaries and initially there was some camaraderie between them. However, Ibn Hanbal began to hear that Al-Muhasibi is speaking about the attributes and writing books about uh, differentiating between the attributes and so he began to warn against uh, uh, Al-Muhasibi and tell people to abandon Al-Muhasibi and it's really interesting there's an anecdote that is found in Tabaqat of Ibn Ya'la and other Hanbali books these are anecdotes that are mentioned and Allah knows how true they are that one of the students of Al-Muhasibi uh, was also a student of Ahmad ibn Hanbal and he wanted to try to reconcile between the two and so he uh, arranged that Ahmad ibn Hanbal secretly attend a lecture of Al-Muhasibi. He arranged that nobody would see you, you're going to be behind a curtain in a room and you're just going to listen and, he, and the student said, I want you to listen and judge for yourself. And so Ahmad ibn Hanbal agreed uh, to do this. Now uh, he happened to listen to a lecture of Al-Muhasibi that was very spiritual. By the way, Al-Muhasibi was very much uh, in uh, was very much into early Sunni Tasawwuf, right? Not later Halajian type of or others. He had a, a strand of Tasawwuf, which is also Ghazalian. So Ghazalian Tasawwuf really is very much uh, Al-Muhasibi in many ways. And that is a, a strong sense of orthodoxy of, you know, following the Sharia and also of spiritual awareness of the Maqamat and the Ahwal and talking about different aspects of the Qalb, uh, which is very Ghazalian uh, Tasawwuf. Al-Muhasibi is like this. So Ahmed ibn Hanbal was listening to one of these types of very moving sermons. When the student returned back to the room where Ahmed ibn Hanbal was listening, he saw Ahmed ibn Hanbal was crying. Like the, the talk affected him so much. And so the student felt maybe Imam Ahmed is going to change his view. However, uh, he did not change his view of Al-Muhasibi and he disapproved. Now, why did he disapprove? Ibn Taymiyyah says, and I quote, that وَأَمَّا, this is from Ibn Taymiyyah's Majmu' Fatawa, وَأَمَّا الْحَارِثِ الْمُحَاسِبِ فَكَانَ يَنْتَسِبُ إِلَىٰ قَوْلِ ibn Kullab وَلِهَاذَا أَمَرَ أَحْمَدْ بِهَجْرِهِ وَكَانَ أَحْمَدْ يُحَذِّرُ عَنْ ibn Kullab وَاتْبَاعِهِ That Al-Muhasibi would follow Ibn Kullab. And because of this, Imam Ahmad ordered that he be boycotted. And Imam Ahmad would warn against Ibn Kullab and the followers of Ibn Kullab. Now, this is an opinion. Another opinion is that Al-Muhasibi was warned against because Ahmad ibn Hanbal felt that his style of preaching, his, his tasawwuf style, was not in accordance with the sunnah even if it was effective and that it might lead to uh, extremisms and exaggerations or some say it was both his uh, proto tasawwuf and his proto kalam that ahmed ibn hanbal warned against him so this could be uh, this could be the first time that there is a tension within Sunnism, this tension will later be manifested in Salafi Islam versus Ash'ari Islam. And this is something that will happen later on. This is the first time where we find this type of awkwardness between two strands of Sunnism, Muhasibian strand and Ahmad ibn Hanbal strand. And uh, at the time, Ahmad ibn Hanbal and his followers were the dominant majority. They were the ones who were respected. And so when Ahmad ibn Hanbal warned against Muhasibi, he was abandoned completely. And his students completely diminished until it is said when he died, barely four people prayed janazah over him. Barely four people prayed janazah over him. 
Now, again, I just like to point out, um, no matter how much trouble this gets me into, one wonders, was this type of warning justified? One wonders, really. Uh, and I've read Muhasibi's works that are in, in existence. And had Al-Muhasibi been alive today, uh, he would really be a very effective mainstream preacher, uh, just like many of the other scholars that are of that, you know, later movement. And, you know, the 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 harshness that one finds in certain trends of Islam, uh, there are clear um, uh, seeds that one finds in the founders of those trends, and let us leave it at that. So uh, Al-Muhasibi was warned against, and because of this, his students abandoned him, and he died uh, an ignoble death, and uh, only four people prayed his uh, janazah. Now, in my reading of early Islam, this appears to be the first sign of tension between Sunnism that would later become uh, what we now call Ash'ari uh, versus Salafi Islam or Athari Islam. And of course, Ibn Taymiyyah and Al-Ghazali represent or are the most popular manifestations of this. There is another small incident that took place uh, in a faraway land uh, in the next generation that also shows this tension between proto-Salafism and proto-Ash'arism. And this uh, is going to take place in the land of Nishapur. In the land of Nishapur. It's a relatively small incident, but it shows that tensions are rising. And this is well documented, this incident, because it's taking place uh, a generation later, uh, almost 80 years after, uh, or 90 years after uh, Muhasibi and, uh, and Ibn uh, Muhasibi and Ahmad ibn Hanbal. And this is the tension that took place in the circle of knowledge of a great scholar of hadith and a great scholar of the Shafi'i school, school, and that is Ibn Khuzayma, the one who authored Sahih Ibn Khuzayma. Ibn Khuzayma died 311 Hijra or 923 Hijra. Now, Ibn Khuzayma is an interesting figure. Ibn Khuzayma is well known as a muhaddith, he's well known as a Shafi'i icon, and yet aqidah wise he is hardcore athari. And I state this factually, please don't read in that I'm trying to be contentious or whatnot. It is an undeniable fact that early Shafi'is and early Malikis and Hanbalis were all what we now call Sifatiyya or Athadis. They were affirming the attributes in totality. This is uh, a later development. Uh, Ash'arism, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, was influenced. Ash'arism influenced the Shafi'i school in the next generation after Ibn Khuzayma, and Ash'arism influenced the Maliki school much later. Uh, as we are aware, the Malikis were anti-Ash'ari, and in fact, they burned the books of Ghazali uh, famously in, in in Andalus because they had their own version of Hamba. I want to say Habilism, That's not the right term here. They had their own version of Sifatiyya. They had their own version of you know being hardcore. You know, in terms of Sunnah and you know, the Malikis really were very, very what we would consider fanatical. They really were. Just look at it. I mean, I'm not inventing this. And uh, early uh, Shafi'is as well were also, uh, uh, you know, very hardcore in this regard. You know what? Actually, subhanAllah, complete coincidence. I just ordered a book from uh, from Egypt here. And it's just, uh, I haven't uh, glanced through it fully. I'm just going to show this to you. It's, uh, I think it's a PhD uh, done by uh, Dr. Taha Naja. Al-Ittijah al-Salafi. الاتجاه السلفي عند الشافعية حتى قرن السادس الهجري. Okay, this is a PhD. The author is claiming or proving in his own way, and I've glanced through it, and I already believe this anyway. But he's trying to show that the majority of Shafi'is were الاتجاه السلفي. يعني أثري is the more more appropriate term. They had the the صفاتية. They were affirming the attributes for their early, you know, for the early parts of the Shafi'i school. And that much I think is undeniable because again, kalam Sunni kalam is a later development. Remember uh, that uh, Al-Ash'ari dies, you know, 320 Hijra. So what is going to happen to the early Shafi'is? You have Ibn Khuzayma. Read Ibn Khuzayma's biography in a tabaqat uh, of uh, uh, Subki. Very much praise of who he is as a Shafi'i and hardly any discussion of his Aqidah because I think Subki understands that uh, Ibn Khuzayma uh, is not upon the Aqidah that he wants him to be upon. And the same goes for many of the early uh, Shafi'i scholars. Now, uh, Ibn Khuzayma, Ibn Khuzayma uh, wrote his famous book, uh, Kitab al-Tawheed. And this Kitab al-Tawheed, it is considered to be an anthropomorphic book by many icons of uh, later Ash'ari school, uh, famously Muhammad Zahid al-Kawthari, uh, the, one of the last icons of the Ottoman Empire. And again, this type of hatred that exists on both sides, I am now 
free of it. I have nothing to do with this hatred. I despise this sectarianism from the Salafis and I despise it from the Ash'aris and both of them need to be told, calm down, chill bro. They're all mainstream Muslims. They love Allah and His Messenger and you guys are exaggerating this way beyond that it needs to. In any, ways, in any case, uh, Zahid al-Kawthiri used to call Kitab al-Tawheed of Ibn Khuzayma. This is Ibn Khuzayma's Kitab al-Tawheed, not Ibn Abdul Wahhab's. This is a totally different book. Ibn Khuzayma's Kitab al-Tawheed wa Ithbat al-Sifat al-Rabb, three volumes. He used to call it Kitab al-Shirk. This is Kitab al-Shirk. Because Ibn Khuzayma wrote this book as a result of Ibn Kullab's ideas arriving in Khurasan, arriving in Nishapur. Ibn, uh, Ibn Khuzayma became worried that this heresy is coming to his land. So to respond to it, he wrote his Kitab at tawheed uh, in around 300 Hijri. And again, this is before uh, this is before Al-Ash'ari uh, rises to fame. Al-Ash'ari is alive, 300, but uh, Ibn Khuzayma predates him. Ibn Khuzayma, is, uh, in terms of age, is uh, older than him. What happened in, uh, in Nishapur with Ibn Khuzayma and his students? Well, a number of Ibn Khuzayma's students began to flirt with uh, Al-Muhasibi and Ibn Kullab's ideas. And they began to say that Allah speaks eternally. He doesn't speak when He chooses to speak. He continuously uh, speaks. And Ibn Khuzayma was shocked at this. Like again, he said this is a very big deal for him. And so he called his students and confronted them. And Imam al-Dhahbi in his Seer Anam al nubala he summarizes this. You can read this up. Uh, he says that uh, Ibn Khuzayma said, uh, his student Abu Ali al thaqaf he says, ما الذي أنكرت أيها الأستاذ من مذاهبنا حتى نرجع عنه What are you criticizing of our theology so that we can repent in front of you? قال Ibn Khuzayma said to al thaqaf Abu Ali al thaqaf famous, he's going to become a famous proto-Ashari icon. قال ميلكم إلى مذهب الكلابية The fact that you are sympathizing to the Kullabi school. Notice, he calls it Kullabi, not Ashari because Ashari is not here right now, right? Ibn Kullab, Muhasibi. مَيْلُكُمْ إِلَى مَذْهَبِ الْكُلَّابِيَّ فَقَدْ كَانَ أَحْمَدِ بْنَ حَمْبَلْ مِنْ أَشَدِّ النَّاسِ عَلَى عَبْدِ اللَّهِ بْنِ سَعِيدِ بْنِ كُلَّابِ وَعَلَى أَصْحَابِهِ مِثْلَ الْحَادِثِ وَغَيْدِهِ So, Ibn Khuzayma is well aware of Ahmad ibn Hanbal's criticism of Ibn Kullab and of Al-Muhasibi. And Ibn Khuzayma says to his students, you are flirting with the Kullabi theology and Imam Ahmad was very harsh against Ibn Kullab and against Al-Hadith. And so, as a response to this, and you can read his introduction, advanced students, pause here the video, go open his book, Kitab al-Tawheed, and read his introduction. He literally says, when I saw these ideas come and my students or whatnot, I wrote this book to respond. And then flick through the pages, it is very clear, uh, and I've said this multiple times, and I, I don't say this because I used to be an Athari or Salafi, I'm saying this because it's factually true, is that Atharism as a school, within Sunnism predates Ash'arism, and this is an undeniable fact. Well, uh, I can say Mu'tazilism predates Atharism, and that's also technically correct. Mu'tazilism as a school predates Atharism, but so what? But I'm just saying, factually speaking, uh, the Athari school, in its affirmation of all of the attributes of Allah, unconditionally, un without any categorization, Atharism predates Ash'arism. And figures like Ibn Kullab, uh, sorry, figures like... Um, uh, uh, Ibn, um, Ibn Khuzayma un uh, showed this, that Ibn Khuzayma is writing these detailed books in which he's affirming all of these attributes in a way that no Ash'ari and no Maturidi and no Mu'tazili would ever uh, agree with. So it's an interesting book and it shows you uh, this minor clash that Ibn Khuzayma is having tensions with his students. So we have now two incidents. The first is Imam Ahmad al-Muhasibi himself and the second is Ibn Khuzayma with his students. Now, a third incident as well and it is this incident that is going to spark the main Sunni Kalam school. And it is an interesting quirk of history that neither Ibn Kullab nor Al-Muhasibi were primarily credited with the launch of Sunni Kalam. That honor was left to a theologian who lived two generations after them, Abu Hassan Ali ibn Ismail al-Ash'ari, who died 324-935 CE, 324 CE, uh, Hijri, 935 CE. And it was his teachings 
who would eventually, he would found the eponymous school, Al-Ash'ari founded the school named after him, and he was the one that basically is credited with Sunni Kalam, even though he's not the first, and even though he is taking from Ibn Kullab and Al-Muhasibi. Now, Al-Ash'ari visited Baghdad, and Baghdad was in that time frame a stronghold of Athari slash Hanbali Islam. This is something that is again an undeniable fact. Baghdad and the Khilafa, the, the Khalifa himself at the time was very much, uh, and you had to be, that was the dominant trend of uh, Baghdad and the Caliphate. And so Al Ash'ari visits Baghdad. Now, this, um, this uh, conversation and this uh, back and forth, it is recorded in. Uh, the tabaqat of the Hanabila of uh, uh, Ibn Abi Ya'la and so you have to take it with a grain of salt that you know the sources are what they are so the tabaqat of the Hanabila records that when uh, Al-Ash'ari visited uh, Baghdad the Shaykh Al-Hanabila of the time none other than Al-Barbahari yes that Al-Barbahari go listen to one of my free previous chats about Sharh Al-Sunnah and the fact that he didn't write the book, that Ghulam Khalil did it, no matter what we say about Al-Barbahari, he was an alim, and he was a sheikh of the Hanbalis, and he would never write a book as ludicrous and as, as sensationalist as uh, this book called Sharh Sunnah. Nonetheless, um, Al-Barbahari was alive at the time, and so Al-Ash'ari visited Al-Barbahari, and tried to ingratiate himself with Al-Barbahari, because he understands that Al-Barbahari is the Shaykh Al-Hanabila, and if Al-Barbahari is not going to accept him, then he will be in uh, serious trouble. And so, uh, if uh, we believe this source, because it is a big if, uh, Al-Barbahari um, uh, was not happy with Al-Ash'ari, and he gave him a very lukewarm uh, treatment. He was very hesitant, like, you sound very weird to me. And Al-Barbahari said to Al-Ash'ari, all we know is what Imam Ahmed says. And your speech doesn't seem to match up with what Imam Ahmed uh, says. So, it is said, it is said, and Allah knows best, that because of this rejection, Al-Ash'ari uh, Al tried to impress Al-Barbahari by writing one of his, no, not one of his most, his most atypical, exotic, inexplicable book, and that is Al-Ibana an Usul al-Diyana, an elucidation on the foundations of the religion. And this book, now here, students, I need you to understand one thing. We have a number of writings of Abu al-Hasan al-Ash'ari recorded. We have his famous, you know, Kitab al-Maqalat, and we have some other treatises as well. This book, Al-Ibana, an Usul al-Diyana, is completely at odds with all of his other writings. There is no question that this book is in its own category, so much so that many later Ash'aris actually claim that he did not write this book. Later Ash'aris say this book is a fabrication, some of them say, because they cannot square it up with the rest of Al-Ash'aris teachings. The fact of the matter is that you could read this book as a Hanbali slash Athari and kind of sort of get away with it. This book is very Hanbali, it is very Athari, it is pretty much almost, not exactly, there are certain things that, phrases that are incorrect from uh, Hanbali standpoints, but still, generally speaking, it seems as if he's pretty much Ahmad ibn Hanbal. And therefore, one wonders, what does one make of this book? Now, I have thought about this question multiple times for the last 20 years. I have read Al-Ibana three times, cover to cover at least, and perused through it many dozens of times. And I'll be very honest with you, no answer fully satisfies me. I know what the opinions are. The, the Ibn Taymiyyah went on a multiple stage. I know this. There's not a shred of evidence, not a shred of evidence that uh, that uh, Al-Ash'ari uh, flirted with atharism for a period of his life. He was Mu'tazili, and then he became Sunni Kalam. There's not a shred of evidence that uh, for a period of his life he was a pure Athari Hanbali and then he became, uh, you know, a Sunni Mutakalim. Not at all. On the contrary, it seems as if yani, from Mu'tazilism he flipped over and he embraced Ibn Kullab. And his book, um, uh, Maqalat, really seems to indicate this. You know, the only uh, answer that makes sense to me, and I hesitate to say this because I don't want this to be interpreted in a negative way, and we expect the best of all people. But the only answer that really would make sense is to, to say that Alibana was written 
as a means of ingratiating himself with his hosts in Baghdad, with Al Barbahari's camp. And that's the only thing that makes sense. And Allah, and Allah knows best how he would justify this with his other writings. I don't know. La Adri. Clearly, he wrote the book because of multiple factors beyond the scope of this library chat. I think it is undeniable that he wrote the book, but it doesn't square with all of his other writings. So either you say that he went through phases, but his biography does not indicate that at all, and there's not a single shred of evidence, or the only thing left to say, unless you say the book is fabricated, which, uh, which is what some later Ash'ari say. The only other thing left to say is, yani he felt however he in his mind justified and i don't doubt his sincerity he felt that this book is good for the hanbali audience and it will allow him to be accepted by them and his other writings might be better for another audience to do wallahu alam this is the only thing that makes sense to me nonetheless even this book did not uh, pass the, the the result and al barbahari rejected him al barbahari did not allow him to teach and preach in baghdad and so Ash'ari himself was not allowed to spread uh, in public because Barbahari controlled the Sunni Masajid. Nobody could preach without Barbahari's approval. And Barbahari did not allow Al Ash'ari to have a public halaqa. Uh, and this is the key point where I'm setting the stage up here, guys. This is in a future library chat. We will discuss in a lot of detail the first time an Ash'ari gave a public lecture in Baghdad, it caused a riot and people died. Literally people died. We're going to talk about this. It was such a massive issue. The Hanabila could not stand it. And the Ash'aris as well acted in a manner they shouldn't have acted. Both of them, you know, they, they had mob mentality. That's not going to happen for another 100 years. Right now, in 320, r roughly 320 Hijrah, roughly, Al-Barbahari and Al-Ash'ari are in the same city. And Al-Ash'ari wants to preach and teach. He visits Al-Barbahari, according to our source here. Al-Barbahari, yani, lukewarm. Al-Ash'ari uh, writes Al-Ibana. Barbahari rejects Al-Ibana -Al and says, Khalas, no, you haven't met the standard. So when it was not, um, it was not accepted, then Al-Ash'ari, Abu Hassan Al-Ash'ari goes full out. And he writes a treatise uh, that is entitled Al-Hath ala al-Bahthi. Al-Hathu ala al-Bahthi. The encouragement to uh, research the encouragement to uh, research and this book is considered to be it is considered to be the first work ever written by an author who claims to be uh, giving allegiance to Sunnism and is explicitly defending the use and role of Kalam. Neither Muhasibi nor Ibn Kullab wrote a book justifying the use of Kalam as a, a, as a style of theology. Al-Ash'ari did so, and this book actually has been translated to English. So you can find this, uh, Richard, uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, Robert McCarthy translated this. And uh, in, in his The Theology of Al-Ash'ari, and he called it a vindication of, of, of Kalam. So you can find this, uh, I'm sure PDFs are available. And R.M. Frank uh, has also written about this, and you can read about uh, this these treatises. This is a treatise in English, uh, very, it's not that long, you can uh, read it. So in this book, he, use, he attempts to justify uh, the usage of, um, uh, of Kalam. Now, uh, Al-Ash'ari was not allowed to preach publicly in Baghdad. However, he did obviously manage to preach privately. And this is where now the foundations of Ash'arism are going to uh, begin in the private halaqat of Baghdad. Al-Ash'ari is taking this notion from Ibn Kullab, from Al-Muhasibi. He hasn't met them there they're a hundred years before him, but he's met some of their students and he's read their writings. Their writings we do not have access to. We do not have any access to the theological writings of Al-Muhasibi or Ibn Kullab. We have Al-Muhasibi's tafsirs, Al-Muhasibi's spiritual stuff. Al-Muhasibi has a treatise on the intellect, Al-Aql. So Al-Muhasibi clearly is you know, a, a person who's a proto-Ghazali in many ways. Al-Ash'ari reads Al-Muhasibi and develops this school and he leaves an impact on a few small uh, uh, groups of students. These students are going to then take his ideas and spread them further. And I'll mention uh, uh, three of the, the students here. Uh, amongst them is uh, Abu al-Hasan al-Bahili, uh, who died 370 Hijrah, and Muhammad ibn Ahmad ibn, ibn Mujahid, who died uh, 370 uh, as well, um, Hijrah. And uh, these students then 
taught the next generation, al Faraini and Ibn Furak, and it was those types of students that spread Ash'arism in other lands. The greatest scholar of Ash'ari Kalam in this next generation was Abdul, Qa, Abdul, um, uh, uh, Abdul Qahir al-Baghdadi, uh, al, sorry, Al-Qadi Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, uh, who died 403 Hijra. And this al-Baghdadi, uh, who wrote uh, At-Tamheed, is considered to be the second Ash'ari. And he was most likely the one who, who coined the term Ash'ari uh, for the school. So it was uh, Al-Baqillani, who died 403, who was the first to coin the term Ash'ari school to describe uh, this uh, school. However, these figures in Baghdad only taught in private. They did not teach in public. And in public, what was being taught? What was being taught was atheism or Hanbalism. And one clear manifestation of this is the official Aqeedah that was taught or that was propagated by the Khalifa himself. And the Khalifa at the time actually commissioned for it to be written and he called it after himself the Khalifa al-Qadir who reigned from 381 to 422 uh, Hijra that's 991 to 1031 the Abbasid Khalifa al-Qadir the Abbasid Khalifa al-Qadir commissioned a treatise to be written about Aqidah and it was called the Qadiri Creed and this creed was commanded to be read aloud uh, in khutbas and in the masajid uh, throughout his reign, you know, from 400 onwards. So for 30 years, this creed was officially read. And if you read this creed, and you can find this online, you can find this in, preserved in multiple books of history. Uh, if you, It's a page long. If you read this creed, it is explicitly an assault on Shi'ism and Mu'tazilism and yes, Ash'adism as well. It is a pro hanbali pro athari creed that is meant to take down all other theologies. And uh, uh, one of the modern academics, George Makdisi, he writes that this creed was distinctly anti-Shi'i, anti-Mu'tazili, anti-Ash'ari, end quote. So the Qadiri creed, which was the official creed of the Abbasid Khilafah, adopted at the beginning of the 5th Islamic century, clearly indicates without a doubt that proto atharism proto hanbalism sifatiyya if you like, it was the dominant state-approved theology by the Khilafah. It was the one dominant amongst the uh, masses. And uh, therefore, when anything challenged it, then this dominancy is going to react and what was going to challenge it? The table is going to be turned, and that table is going to be the rise of Ash'adism. So when Ash'adism is going to be introduced in Baghdad, it's going to cause a political turmoil of the highest magnitude, and the Khalifa himself is going to be dragged in, and the Khalifa is going to be forced to intervene and quell the tension here. We're going to talk about that in our next lecture, so I'm setting up uh, the stage here. What I want you to understand with all of these dry details, and I understand for some of you is totally you know beyond the scope and boring and it is what that's what intellectual history is the key point i want you to understand is that the dominant theological school of the capital of the muslim world and the one that the khalifa adopted and the one that controlled the masajid was what we now call yani hanbalism and by the way this version of hanbalism this version of atharism is way beyond what ibn taymiyyah the, this version is the one affirming that the prophet sallam sits on the throne and uh, if you read the you know kitab uh, al-tawhid um, uh, of ibn khuzaima you know, go read it and you'll see what i'm saying here it's a different version of hanbalism ibn taymiyyah frankly is toning down this version of hanbalism uh, sometime uh, afterwards nonetheless so understand that Al-Ash'ari himself and his immediate followers are not making a huge impact. They cannot make an impact in Baghdad, in the capital. No, this is the story we're going to take up in the next lecture. What happens here in summary is that Ash'ari is not successful in Baghdad. It's not in Baghdad where Ash'arism rises up and overthrows Hanbalism. No, what's going to happen is that Ash'ari's teachings are exported to a small outlying province outside of the dominion of the Abbasid Khalifa, where 
it's a free for all. And these provinces, in particular Nishapur, which is in modern day Iran, Ash'arism is going to be exported from Baghdad where it's born. Abu Hassan Ash'ari is living in Baghdad. He doesn't have a large halaqa, but he has a small groups there. It is exported from Baghdad to Nishapur. And in Nishapur, for the first time, its madrasas are built. Ash'ari madrasas are built. And in Nishapur, it will win converts, some of whom would eventually wield great political might. It was those supporters, both the scholars and the politicians in Nishapur, that would then reintroduce a modified and updated and reified version of Ash'arism back to the very cities where it originated. But this time, they're going to introduce it from a position of power. And so, rather than Ash'arism being frowned, rather than Barbahari rejecting, on the contrary, the new theology will have the support of the government. And it will supplant and eventually dominate all other theologies, eventually becoming the official theology of the Muslim Khilafah. That story is going to be the story of our next uh, lecture. So to summarize this, and I know it's a very uh, advanced chapter, but this needs to be said because again, these things need to be said. So the, the goal of this entire chat was very, very simple. And that is to explain that early Sunnism was essentially sifatiya. They are all affirming the attributes and not categorizing the attributes. What happens is that one figure in particular, uh, followed by al-Hadr al-Muhasibi, so you have Ibn Kullab and then al-Muhasibi. They're contemporaneous. Uh, we don't have much biographical information about Ibn Kullab. We don't have a single writing of his left. These were the first people to respect the Sahaba and respect uh, or believe in Qadr. And so they're Sunni and they're overall studying the circles of Hadith. By the way, none of them actually studied Hadith. None of them are Hadith scholars. Even Al-Ash'ari is not a Hadith scholar. Hadith scholars, actual Hadith scholars of this time frame, pretty much all of them are Sifatiya. They are uh, yani what we call Athadis or Hanbalis. That's not going to happen for a while. People like Al-Bayhaqi and others are going to be the first in a, um, uh, a group that is specializing in hadith and also somewhat pro kalam. That's going to happen 400 hijra. Right now, in 200 hijra, there is no scholar, not one, not one that is compiling hadith, interested in hadith, and is also sympathetic to Ibn Kulab that doesn't exist right now. However, Ibn Kulab is Sunni. What do I mean by Sunni? I mean, as I said, uh, that he uh, respects the books of hadith and he believes in qadr. This is the key distinction here. And Al-Muhasibi is Sunni. And uh, Imam Ahmed al Hanbal rejects Ibn Kullab, rejects Al-Muhasibi. Uh, the next generation comes along and uh, Al-Ash'ari comes and Al-Ash'ari tries once again to uh, become mainstream. A key point here, when Ibn Hanbal rejected and Al-Barbahari rejected, they did not consider this strand to be Mu'tazili. They did not. Rather, they were uncomfortable at where this is heading, but they didn't even say that they're non-Sunni. They said this is a deviation creeping in, but they viewed it as a strand within Sunnism, an incorrect strand, a deviated strand. There's no doubt about that, but they did not view it as being Mu'tazili. This is going to come later on when the tensions are going to rise up. So we're still talking about proto-Ash'arism, proto-Hanbalism. These are all various strands. The earliest Ash'ari scholars, the earliest scholars who followed this trend did not view themselves as a separate sect from mainstream Sunnism. They viewed themselves as following mainstream Sunnism, just like the followers of Ahmed ibn Hanbal also viewed themselves as following mainstream Sunnism. Uh, to conclude, uh, the next major figure we're going to come to is the figure of Ibn Furaq. Ibn Furaq um, is the one who uh, is the first scholar to be uh, patronized by the dynasties of uh, Khorasan, the dynasties of Nishapur, and uh, to be have a, masj, a madrasa built for him and the students sponsored. So the first Ash'ari madrasa is the mas madrasa of Ibn Furaq. And Ibn Furaq is building this madrasa not in Baghdad. He cannot do this in Baghdad. He's building this in Nishapur. And the Simjurid dynasty, the Simjurid dynasty uh, patronized him. Now, why would they do that? Again, you have to realize, let's, we can have one of two motivations, right? Some would say because they agreed and they 
followed his theology, and that's fine to say. I'm a little bit more cynical, and um, uh, so be it. يعني, uh, I would say that mostly, generally speaking, the general rule of the world is that politicians uh, um, uh, patronize uh, scholars in order to increase their popularity. P politicians help scholars when those scholars will, or at least their followings will help these rulers. So they saw in Ibn Furak and his students whatever they saw, and they decided to build and to gift and to uh, make a waqf for him. And so the Simjurid dynasty built a madrasa for Ibn Furak, and this was the first time Ash'arism becomes publicly taught and codified. Ibn Furak has a number of writings uh, still left. Ibn Furak, uh, uh, this is around 370 Hijra, and Ibn Furak uh, passes away. Ibn Furak uh, passes away in the year 406 Hijri. 406 Hijra. Ibn Furak, of course, by the way, I, I mentioned him in the previous lecture about um, uh, the rise of the Karamiya because the fanatical uh, Karamis they actually murdered Ibn Furak. I mentioned Ibn Furak as well when I had a previous library chat about the uh, refutation controversies and I mentioned Ibn Furak as well. They hated Ibn Furak so much that they literally poisoned him to death. Uh, and so Ibn Furak died a very uh, uh, ignoble death because of this. But of course, his memory and his madrasa lived on. And uh, I'm going to stop and pause here to simply set up the stage for our next lecture. So now the stage is as follows. Ash'arism has basically been exiled from, from Baghdad. Baghdad is hardcore, fanatical, yani proto hanbali hardcore. We're talking about Barbahari Hanbalism, not Ibn Taymiyyah and Hanbalism. Ibn Taymiyyah has another 400 years left to come. And Ash'ari theology is only existing in small private halaqas in Baghdad. And now, finally, there is a window open for it. Where? All the way in Nishapur. Ibn Furak opens up a madrasa, and it is at this madrasa where the movers and shakers are going to study that will eventually, eventually work their way up to the Sultan's palace, and through the Sultan, work their way back to Baghdad, and from Baghdad, work their way to the rest of the entire Muslim world. This is where I'm going to stop and just mention one of the campus things. Stop here. Uh, you do realize these library chats, a lot of them are impromptu. So my mind just wanders here and there. I'm going to mention this now, and I'll mention it again in my next lecture. The reason why I was interested in this topic for the longest time, when I was uh, a Thadi Sarafi, uh, was I was really getting very like obsessed with the question of why Ash'arism dominated Muslim intellectual thought for 500 years, and if not more than that. Why? Why did it dominate from you know 500 600 hijri onwards there's no question by the time ibn taymiyyah comes ash'arism is the dominant trend and it has remained the dominant trend uh, up until our times in terms of intellectual nobody can deny this yani the middle ages of islam please yani uh, dear salafi reader please calm down be realistic yani don't don't become fanatical let's be real here and i knew this even in medina that's what it troubled me at the time why is the Ash'ari school the dominant school from 600 Hijri you know, up until pre-modernity? And when I say dominant, I mean intellectually dominant. I know what I'm saying here. I know the response is, oh, the masses are as they are. Yes, leave the masses alone. In terms of ulama al-fiqh, in terms of ulama al lugha in terms of ulama al-tafsir, from the 600 onwards, the vast majority of them were either Ash'ari uh, and a smaller percentage were Maturidi. Why? This troubled me. And I was very curious about this question. And in Medina, I used to keep on asking and researching and no solid answers were given. We were given our standard ghuraba and this and that and firqa najiyah type of stuff. And that's when I decided to do my own research in this regard. And of course, I had no idea, but in my own way of studying, I left my sectarian mindset behind me and I'm no longer obsessed with why for the sake of refuting. I'm obsessed with why simply for the sake of understanding. And the fact of the matter, undeniable fact, politics plays a massive role. It plays a role in the rise of modern atheism, Salafism. It plays a role and it played a role in the rise of Ash'arism as well as it used to play a role in the, in the Baghdadian Abbasid Khalifa in the orthodoxization of the Hanbali school. Politics and religion are always interconnected and there's almost always an inexplicable link between politics and between mainstreaming of certain views and ideas. And so 
it just so happened, I'm kind of giving the, the, the talk away, but not the details. It just so happened that certain influential Ash'ari scholars were at the right time and the right place and the right political uh, uh, milieu such that they were picked up and their views and ideas were mainstreamed across the Ummah at an opportune time when there was a vacuum. And so those ideas kind of sort of, I call it the first domino. And I'm jumping the gun here. All of this, if it's too cryptic for you, I apologize. I wasn't supposed to talk about this in this talk. Today's talk was to set up the stage and it will be a necessary precursor to the next talk. And with that, inshallah, I will pause here. And whenever we do the next talk, you would have had to listen to this one and the previous one to set the stage for the rise and the dominance of the Ash'ari school. Today's talk was simply the beginnings of Sunni uh, Kalam. And with that, inshallah, I will see you next time. Wassalamu alaikum. ورحمة الله وبركاته فيا ذلي ويا خجلي إذا ما قال لي ربي أما استحييته تعصيني ولا تخشى من العتب وتخفي الذنب عن خلقي وتأبى في الهوى قربي فتب مما جنيت عسى تعود إلى رضا الرب تعود إلى رضا الرب